I what what we're going to do now is just uh, um, have a bit of a discussion among the four of us to find out uh, really take the subject forward on funding. Being a first time investor in these times, uh, what's the best route to take? Flip, buy to let, HMO, or anything else? So, Susanna, would you like to kind of give your uh, two pennies worth on that one? So I have single let student lets, HMOs and service accommodation. Um, we shut down my entire service accommodation portfolio and put it out to single lets uh, a week before lockdown. So we will get a huge boost again. So but at the moment, you can't really do service accommodation. Um, students, all of my students are fine. So if you're going to do HMOs, I would move you towards a student portfolio at the moment, but you've got to look at the risk. What's happening with your local university? Are they going to get all the students coming in next year? Are they going to be dropping prices and absorb all the students? So we have had every student, because we we'd already sold our student properties for September last January. We did let people out of their contracts if they wanted to come out. I only had one group of students come out of their contract. And if you are going to do HMOs, I would definitely do top end where you're charging top end prices and doing um, en suites with a Jack and Jill bathroom because of the VOA, the valuation office thing. So, and But the other thing I would say as a first-time investor, always give yourself options. Never back yourself into a corner. So if you're going to do either a student let, a single let, or an HMO, um, make sure it's a 10% yield and above. And for an HMO, it should be like 17 to 23%, but also make sure it's quite a 20% markup for a flip. So if either the market doesn't help you, or you change your mind, you can flip it or rent it, and you're happy either way. So uh, let's um, uh, ask for a few predictions then from you guys. Um, where do you think we'll be in a year's time? I mean, it's all going to uh, change a little bit uh, when we come out of lockdown, but how? I mean, Helen, what do you think? What, what, do, you, what do you think? Where do you think we'll be in a year, property market-wise? I'm, I'm afraid I'm always the, the doom and gloom merchant. Oh, uh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm like, I, I would prefer to know, what I'm, and it's something I always ask my developers, what's the worst case that can happen? If I'm prepared for the worst case and with surprises on the upside, then happy days. So, you know, I, I, I do actually know, I was chatting with Ruth today, actually, and saying, she says some some um, property prices are, are going up. If we're talking about the the, the um, house market, so prices are going up. So I think you might see kind of short term kind of, uh, you know, people ready to deploy cash and a, and a little kind of spike. But I'm I'm concerned that for the economy in general, we haven't really seen the shocks and the, the disruptions of the supply, supply chain kind of kind of hit yet. I think that's going to start happening in three months time. And, and, and I am worried about about that. So I think there's better opportunities. I mean, the good side, the good spin on that is there's going to be lots of opportunity. But a year's time, I think we'll be st struggling still in house prices and the economy, personally. I mean, Evan, you've got some development projects up and uh, uh, sort of coming to fruition. When the market goes into recession, sometimes um, new build um, sale prices become severely challenged. Uh, is that a concern to you? The Newport market is supported very strongly at the moment by help to buy. Mm. And I think people still want to buy new houses. People still want to move. Um, it is supported by sentiment to a large extent. Um, but I think one of the things that is, a, is, is pretty much constant with economics is that if you pump money into an economy, it causes a flat inflation. Yeah. And there's an enormous amount of money being pumped into the economy at the moment. So that is going to cause asset prices to increase one way or another. Um, an increase in asset prices is always inevitably followed by a crash. The question is when. Um, and I, Helen is right in, in highlighting the risk that a high level of employment could potentially cause the market to, to tail off. But I, say, I think in the short term at least, and when I say the short term, I mean the next one to two years, we're likely to see asset prices rise. I think what will drive things beyond then is how well we recover from COVID and how quickly we we recover from from COVID. In other words, you know how how quickly do we get back to normal? How quickly quickly do we pick employment back up again from you know the, the points that we are the point that we are at the moment where everyone who I mean everyone who is furloughed is basically unemployed. That's you know they're just, they're just getting paid eighty percent of what they normally get paid. When we had the 2009 thing, um, what I noticed, because I, I kind of filled my boots with property in 2009 to 2014, really, but as soon as the job market began to pick up again, 
then what happened was the effects of the quantitative easing started to create the asset bubble. Yes. So, and these guys have pumped in three times more money already into the economy than they did after the 2009 thing. So really, as soon as the job market begins to bounce back, which might take a year, 18 months, who knows, but then there's all that potential asset bubble to come. Well, I think so. And, and actually, you know, we've got a combination of really interesting factors. Historically low interest rates, they could be negative soon. Um, I think the, the sentiment is not negative out there. People mm -hmm. feel negative when they can't afford things. The banks are still lending, right? So another thing that strongly drives acquisition of properties is ability to get finance. Yes, some buy lenders pull out of the market um, at the early stages of lockdown, but they've come back in again. LTVs are going back up again. There isn't a problem with owner-occupier mortgages. There definitely isn't a problem with held by mortgages. So, um, I don't. I think the the, the short term short term outlook for new home for new homes is relatively good. But but it's it's going to be critically important to have help to buy it. And it it, it has been many developments that are selling eighty percent of their properties using help help to buy. I mean, that's the crush that's holding the market up. Yes, that's that's very, very true this time, and that wasn't available last time. So where are people going to be putting their money over the next few years? Because I, I see an asset bubble coming at some point, and it's almost as though if you have some cash, there is a potential of that cash being worth less through inflation. So where do you hedge it? Wine? Not not any that. Um, well, wine would be a good place. I would put it in, in, in Grand Cru Burgundy, actually. <laughs> Throughout the global financial crisis, um, Domain de Romani Conti, write that down. <laughs> I, was, I, I, I would if I could spell it. <laughs> the risk, the risk, Aerodite, is, Aerodite. <laughs> the risk is that you could actually end up paying to have your money in the bank, right? Mm. So if interest rates become negative, then I mean, what that's a great incentive to get people spending again. And one of the keys to get the economy going, actually, ironically, is to get people spending. Yeah. So if the government can get, because people won't spend if they're not sure about the future. If people get start spending again, the economy will grow. That will bring up employment, and we'll, we'll, we'll get we'll get growth again. And so it could be one of the tools alongside quantitative easing that actually gets the the the, the economy restarted. Apart from being in lockdown and not yet being able to navigate your way back to Malta, um, how what's next for you in the next eighteen months for investing, and where do you get excited about it? To be honest, I, I'm desperate to get back to Malta so I can get back to my nice quiet life. This lockdown has been, I've been working till 2am in the morning. I'd like to get back to the beach, really. <laughs> um, but what it has given me is the opportunity to learn about stuff or, or kind of different strategies, if you will, that I've not before. So um, I've le listened to some really good stuff by Susie Carter and Kirsty Darkins on the commercial side of stuff. It's not something I've done, I've been exposed to much before so I'm learning lots about different pockets that I've not had exposure to and you know I am a I'm a tortoise I'm not a hare so talk to me in a year's time and I'll still probably be thinking about it but it's been great to have that opportunity to learn about that type of stuff. So it's sort of a period of reflection really in order to think about another another egg in, an, in another nest so yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, I'm, I'm so much about diversification and, you know, this kind of shocks, you know, to, 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 the, to the economic and the um, housing system has, has, has really kind of focused the mind on, gosh, you need to be even more diversified if possible. So you know, how do we look at that and, and, and where are the opportunities that, that I don't know? I, I say earn your right to risk. I won't go into anything if I don't understand it or have a decent understanding of it. Yeah. So that's why I'm, I've been, you know, learning lots about new new places. I think um, that question was quite illuminating because it really shows um, the kind of people uh, that you guys are. Because you know, when with a lot of people who have been in lockdown, it's it's what what uh, box set they've binged watch on Netflix. But with you guys, with all of us, it's it's learning a new game, it's learning new stuff, it's pivoting our business, it's excitement of, um, of, of, of changing, adapting to thrive in the coming times. And that's a different level of excitement. And uh, I think that's a very entrepreneurial trait. Uh, you know, and, and I kind of echo everything that you guys have said. And I, I think there's a big difference in 
people who are entrepreneurial and people who are not in the in the way they use their time to to learn and step up their game to do new things uh, to figure out how uh, yes things is change are changing but um no one's going to sort of uh, roll over and accept it and do nothing we all know that when there's change there is opportunity as long as you rise up to the challenge and step up your game and that's what i'm hearing from all of you guys it's absolutely true you know there's a huge amount of opportunity uh, in this environment but you just have to think about doing things differently so it's looking for the silver lining on the cloud and we have done we've closed a couple of deals in the last month that we probably wouldn't have done if it wasn't for the current current environment People are looking to do things differently, so they're more open to JVs if perhaps they've got something that they can't sell. Or so you just have to think about creative structuring. And I think you can't. You, we there is the old normal is not the new normal. The mm -hmm. new normal is how do we adapt and how do we how do we do things differently in this new world? I, I, I wouldn't mind just picking up on the point that Helen made about risk. Actually, I think this is really important. Um, one of the things for us when we have investors in our projects is is that a lot of investors um, don't necessarily understand that relationship between risk and, 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 and security and return. And that's probably one of the most important things when you're looking at investment. What security are you getting? And does the rate of return match the security? If you're getting a really strong security, a first charge, you shouldn't expect 20% return on your investment. You're just not gonna get it. If you're putting equity into a project, then you, you shouldn't be looking for 5 or 6% return because the security that you're getting doesn't match with the return that you're getting. For equity, you need to be looking at 20% plus. So I think it's a question of matching, matching, matching security with return that's very important. And this whole thing about control is, is very interesting as well. We have an investor that we work with that's put £6 million into one of our projects. Um, that, that, that is a small proportion of the overall amount of money that they have. They're a family office. And I can tell you the degree to which they tie us up in knots and in terms of what we can and can't do on that project is extreme. They put themselves in a position where if they wanted to, they could take that control. So really, they have us completely under the thumb. Now, you can only be in, in that position if you are, you know, if you if you have um, that sort of money to, to deploy. But um, what's interesting is, is not only do they tie us up to that extent, but they're very experienced and they understand exactly what they're doing. They understand how risk works, probably in some ways better than we do, and they actually help us deliver the project. So they're adding value. It's it's not just money; it's smart money. And and I think those those guys have successfully been in real estate equity investment for thirty years, and they really they really know their stuff. And so so there are some lessons that you can learn from from people that you work with. Do you um, feel dressing properties is necessary in all areas? And also, uh, what areas do you have your HMOs in? Ah, Bristol, a nine minutes drive from my house. Uh, the couple of the outliers are 17 minutes. So all within a very, very tight uh, circle within Bristol city centre. Um, yes, you're not selling a shed, LR. You're selling a house. And also think about your customer because you're not really selling a beautiful dovetail joint. You're selling a hope of love, affection, comfort, food, sex, you know, uh, warmth, homework, children, whatever you're selling, it's home. That's what you're selling. And who makes that decision in a heterosexual couple? I'm not going to guess it's the guys, generally. Like no. one of a hundred men will be like, honey, we're living here. 99 out of a hundred will be, sweetheart, this is our new home. Okay. <laughs> so now let's think who are your buyers? They're probably women. Mm -hmm. Helen, you love design and staging. I, well, not staging, but design. I love design. Um, if you, LR, if you go to the high street, it's probably more for women than men, and those windows are dressed beautifully. Why? Because we respond to it. I'm going to suggest another reason as well, which mm -hmm. is um, because folks like Evan will be selling into the first-time buyer market with the benefit of help to buy, or should I say help to sell, and the people are uh, coming up with 5% deposit, and they will have nicely staged homes too. And if you're flipping – you, you don't benefit from help to sell or help to buy, as it's officially called. Uh, so you have to give it a bit of a boost. Yeah. And if you're in the location near Evan, you should definitely, I mean, this with kindness, you should go and check out how he does it. Because how an experienced person does it is how you should be doing it. You can replicate that stuff. Exactly. Susanna's spot on. Go and see some show homes that developers do. But actually, more importantly, take, take notice of what they advertise. Yes. 90% of the advertising doesn't actually have the properties in it. It's got mm. a picture of a family playing together or a couple cooking in the kitchen. Yes. What they're selling is a dream. Yes. And 
So you're now spot on in terms of who makes the decision about the house. And it's one of the reasons why kitchens are very important in, in homes and bathrooms. Kitchens and bathrooms sell places, dressing sells places, and it's the women that make the decisions. Question, what's next for you? Because you and I have conversations about, you know, get together, consult <coughs> investors, buy blocks of flats. What, it, what are you going to be doing in the next three years based on COVID? Because that is going to be interesting. Well, I'm a big fan of commercial property, and I think the government's brought in so many permitted development rights to allow them to be repurposed very, very easily without the hassle of planning permission. Um, and I think there's a massive oversupply of commercial properties, particularly retail and office which is now going to be, um, that oversupply has become accelerated because of the shutdown. Yeah. Uh, the change that was already happening and was taking a few years has kind of shifted up a gear. So over the next couple of years, there are going to be huge amount of commercial real estate coming um, on uh, for sale. Um, there's not going to be the commercial demand for it. And there's going to be the opportunity to basically, in a market that isn't doing anything, I see the opportunity as taking commercial real estate, which is low priced per square foot, and repurposing it to residential space without going through planning, but getting an immediate uplift, mm. um, even if the market is static, because residential per square foot is usually a lot more than commercial per square foot. And that's just like an immediate opportunity to kind of make a bit of hay when the sun shines. I mean, Evan, you do a bit of commercial. I mean, have you got any views on that um, bit of off the cuff? Uh, strategizing absolutely look i mean the, the 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 high street was in decline before we went into lockdown and so what lockdown has done and what coronavirus has done is accelerated a trend that was already underway people who have started relying on online shopping during lockdown are not going to go back to going if you going can get a slot you have to wake up you have to be up at 12 at midnight but go on <laughs> yeah, you can arbitrage a bit between between <laughs> providers but yeah, that's true yeah um but, but people are not going to go back to and, – and actually, by the way, that, those, those companies are ramping up their operations significantly and will catch up. But um, the, and, and, in fact, in many ways, are already catching up. But people who have got used to the convenience of online shopping and, and, and are not going to go back to wanting to shop in physical shops again. So we will still shop, but the high street will, will – it'll accelerate that decline of the high street. And so that opportunity for repurposing buildings, not just into residential – but also into other uses. So one of the one of the markets that we're focused on is hotel and, and apart hotel market. Mm -hmm. I think we'll create some great opportunities there. Some of the challenges, I mean, with 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 Resi, there can be challenges around around getting consent. Okay, not with PD, but there can be challenges about getting consent for Resi and town centre sites. And actually, mixed use developments, which incorporate more active uses on the ground floor, like cafes, retail, maybe smaller retail um, units. You know, the, the, the days of 100, 200,000 square foot retail units are over. They're going to be display units. They're going to be 5,000, 10,000 square foot units at the most. Those are That's where the demand is going to be. And then sitting behind that, you're going to have other uses, things like apart hotels, perhaps co-living. Um, you might have cafe space, gyms. Well, the, well, the cafe would be more the active uses at the front. So you can have active uses on the on the on the facades, and then other uses. When you were talking about active uses, I was sure you meant gyms, but I'm rather refreshed to hear that active uses is cafes because I can handle that sort of active uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 use. I can it's about, handle it's that. about what brings life into the street, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> yes. Actually, Ranjan, that's that's one of the the one of the things I've been doing to to kind of gen up on the commercial side is watching the video that you made with the lovely Kieran Gill. Yes. Kind of that strategy and actually getting more into that and and really understanding kind of how that works and what to look for. So that that's a really good one. I think people should watch that. Thank you. Um, listen, I'm going to throw at you all a final question, completely. Uh, off the cuff. So we, we've got another two, three weeks of lockdown, probably. Um, what would you recommend um, that I want just one idea or skill or something that people should go out there and learn or brush themselves uh, or brush up on or acquire new particular skills so that when we come out of lockdown, um, they have something that will equip them for, 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 for something ahead? I mean, if you're asking, if you're recommending people spend their time to do something uh, to learn or brush up on a particular skill, what would that be? For me, that's meditation. Meditation? I think, yeah, I think this time is actually, I think we'll look back and realise it's been a lot more stressful than we maybe necessarily gave it credit for. 
Um, I'm big into meditation, been into that for a while, do it every morning for an hour or two hours and, and, and yeah, really sets me up for the day. So I, I, yeah, I mean, start with three minutes, you know, start with something really easy and manageable, but it, it it's actually life changing. No, I agree. I mean, I think, um, yeah. Susanna, what, what would you be your suggestion? So um, I'm going to assume that you've got the skill of sourcing deals and raising finance. OK, because those if you don't, those are the two that you need to get into if you're talking about property. Mm. Um, so for me, it would be tech. Now, I'm not a natural tech person, but I am getting there. And a really important uh, conversation about three years ago with Matt Elder, who also uh, writes about tech for Property Investor News and who you know. Mm. We've um, been doing some videos with Matt reviewing tech as it applies to property entrepreneurs later so subscribe yeah. like all of that jazz sorry Susanna carry well, on he he and I are quite good friends and we we, we give each other mm. a chat on the phone and his comment is I spend a thousand four hundred a year on what you spend 70 grand on salaries on now that's quite something um and so I do think that whole automation that that, that Basically, tech is now available for people like me who don't have the technical skills and I don't do code because they've got they've done that and they've moved it forward. And I think property investors generally are very slow at tech and automation. And we should be looking for efficiencies in our business. Don't forget, we're running businesses. And, and so let's get efficiencies. That's going to come home to roost in the next five, 10 years in a big, big way. Fully agree. Um, Evan, what's your thought? It's interesting, actually, what Susanna said about tech. Also very interesting what um, what uh, Helen said about meditation. I also meditate a little bit. I don't know that I could meditate for two hours. I can meditate for about 15 minutes, but maybe I'm just a bit less patient than Helen is. I'm not sure. Um, but I do find that it's great clearing your mind. Um, and you know, on the tech side of things, um, I've my background's in the technology industry, so it's something that I bought into the business really from, from when I started it. And actually, in many ways, relied perhaps too much on it to do too much on my own without building a team. And then suddenly found when I had to build a team that um, that consumed an enormous amount of time and effort. What I would say is that this is a great time to actually make your business run more efficiently, as Susanna said, but also, and, and we've taken the time to do that, but also to pursue new opportunities, you know, things maybe that you haven't done to put your business in a better shape to actually grow as we come out of lockdown. And again, that's something that we've been doing. We've, we're, in, we're in the process of developing a series of, of investment products. Um, that's something that we have been able to do because we've just had a little bit more bandwidth to be able to focus on that side of things while we're in lockdown. But we've also focused on getting our existing team running much more efficiently. We've been able to spend a, a lot more time with one another. Um, that the challenge has been has been managing the number of Zoom calls. I think it's very easy to, to spend all day on Zoom calls and not get any work done. That is so. true. I I I I know you guys have been the same, but I feel I I'm sure I've spoken at more events during lockdown than at any sort of eight week period of my life. It's been. <laughs> you've got to control the you've got to control the Zoom calls. If you're on them all day, you never think yeah. So, yes, yeah. that's true as well. That is very true. Okay, listen, guys, and if you want to hear my views uh, on what you should learn, well, just um, subscribe and like, and you get notified when we release a video because we put out new videos all the time. Listen, guys, it's been absolutely great. Guys, any final words? Just good luck um, to everybody. You know, yeah. um, make it happen, go for it, work hard, good luck. Yeah, look for the opportunities. I think um, it's it's been really great ch chatting with you guys, but great time to be looking for new opportunity go and find new ways of doing stuff yeah absolutely there's going to be a lot of opportunities out there and stay happy and healthy everybody yeah. brilliant thanks very much so uh, stay tuned for more opportunities on this channel like subscribe comment until next time uh, thanks for joining